In 1982, the South Bank Show met the writer Patricia Highsmith to talk about her most well-known creation, the character of Tom Ripley, an amoral crook and killer and hero of five of her novels. We dramatise extracts from the second novel, Ripley Underground, where Tom is driven to extreme measures in order to protect his interest in a forged paintings racket. It had been Tom's idea to get Bernard Tufts to try his hand at forging some Derwent paintings. Now Derwent Limited was big business. Tom had kept his name and reputation amazingly clean, considering all he did. It would be most embarrassing if it were in the papers that Thomas Ripley had dreamed up the money-making fraud of Derwent Limited and had for years been deriving a percentage from it. Good afternoon, madam. Good afternoon. Hi, Scott. Good afternoon. 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 Your favourite among your characters is Tom Ripley. What do you like about him particularly? That he's um, rather free in spirit and audacious and occasionally amusing to me too. Can you describe what Ripley was like at the beginning of the uh, first Ripley book, The Talented Mr. Ripley, and then how he developed by the time we get to Ripley Underground? Well, in the first Ripley he was um, quite green and young, I think 26, and uh, just learning about Europe or the, what he thought was culture and sightseeing. And then he became en envious of the richer young man, as the readers know. <laughs> and he decided to, um, to lift himself in his own eyes. Patricia Highsmith was one of the more intense writers I met. I don't think it was to do with nerves in the slightest. I don't think it was to do with how she appeared in public. She was very tense, indrawn, and in many ways harboring and trying to rein in opinions which would have been had she let them loose entirely unpalatable and sort of ruined her reputation. So there was this holding in about her. And the film that the South Bank Show made was directed by a man called Jack Bond, who directed two or three films for us, of great distinction. And what he wanted to do here was to imitate the novel by creating dramatic scenes without Patricia Highsmith knowing and without telling her, which was a little bit. Anyway, he didn't tell me, he didn't tell her, because if he told me he wasn't going to tell her, I'd have told him that was wrong, he should have told her, but he didn't. And one of the ideas was that when she landed in London, she would be followed by Jonathan Kent, who was playing Ripley, and that's dramatic, in those dramatic portions of the film. Well, she quite quickly, according to Jonathan Kent, uh, clicked onto the fact that she was being followed. And at a, an appropriate or uh, a good moment, turned on him, marched up to him, got him by the lapels, pushed him against a wall, and asked him what he thought he was up to. And when he explained, she took it in good part and saw this cheerful, handsome Jack Bond <laughs> with the crew somewhere over there. The only, the one murder that bothers him sometimes is the Dickey murder because... Uh, the first murder? Yes, because yeah. the, uh, the motive was very, very sordid and Dickey had been a good friend to him. 
But the other murders, all of them, I think, even Frankie in, uh, in the first book, uh, he was about to uncover the fact that Tom was playing the part of Dickie, and Tom thinks quickly, this murder is necessary, and then he does it. And so that's the way, also in Ripley Underground, that the murder of Murchison is necessary because Murchison was about to... Blow his cover. Yes, uh, blow up um, the Derwatt hoax, which would have involved seven or eight people and quite a lot of money for each of the, the people. And so Ripley thinks, again, that unfortunate, but it's necessary. Would you describe him as insane, or how would you...? Yes, I mean, I think certain areas he could be called psychotic, uh, and in the sense of being, so well, psychopathic, in the sense of being a bit sick in certain areas. But I would not call him insane, because he, uh, his actions are rational. The first story I really remember is when I was 16 years old. In the high school where I was going, there were three copies of a certain history book. And there were so many uh, girls, it was an all-girls high school, trying to get at the book at the same time. It was a rather chunky book, costing, you know, nobody thought of buying it somewhere. <laughs> uh, so it, it occurred to me to steal it. So I wrote a story about a girl who did. Uh, I never, I, I didn't steal it. So um, that was my first uh, short story. And it was published in, <laughs> published, <laughs> that's a joke. But it was printed in um, the school magazine. And it was not bad. Same style as I'm using now. <laughs> really? Very simple, yep, <laughs> very simple style. Did you have, ever have any uh, childhood fantasies about killings or anything like that yourself? No, um, not of any people, no. I may have disliked some people, but not that. Uh, but um, um, it's not quite the same thing, but I think I was nine or 10. I had, uh, I had a feeling I would die when I fell asleep. And I was afraid of that. And I used to, uh, it took me ages to get to sleep. I remember many a time I was up awake until two and I had, had the feeling I would stop breathing. So I used to take water and snuff it up my nose a bit as if um, that would keep me awake somehow. That must have gone on several weeks, or months even. But uh, it's not this, that's fear of death is not quite the same thing. I think Patricia Highsmith is really in a category of her own. She's obviously not really a literary writer. She herself said that style didn't interest her in the least. And her books are very much action-driven. And yet at the same time, she's not in an obvious way simply a crime novelist. I think she is a different thing. She's a novelist of stealth, of disquiet, of menace. And the nearest person I think one could compare her to, and who perhaps owes something to her, although I think actually Highsmith is incomparable or inimitable, is Ruth Rendell. They both have these extraordinarily intricate plots, very, very dense writing when one looks at it, but apparently effortless, action-driven, fictions. There's a particular problem with Patricia Highsmith because she doesn't do some of the things which traditional crime novelists do and which makes them popular. Because the crime novel, detective fiction and so on, is inherently a conservative genre. It consists of disrupting the world and then putting it to rights. Patricia Highsmith doesn't do that. She disrupts it and leaves it disrupted. This is deeply disturbing for people. Ripley is a murderer. And so there's this moral dilemma for the reader, and I would should imagine for yourself as well. Yes, for myself as well, that's true. Uh, but I think it's more amusing if the uh, reader has to deal with somebody like uh, Ripley, just because he's neither good nor bad, and because he's unusual. He's not so psychopathic that he has a desire to kill somebody like some people you read about in newspapers. Are you saying then that uh, um, the fact that somebody murders, the fact that Ripley murders, let's stick to Ripley, uh, doesn't mean that he's all bad? There are all sorts of qualities which are to be admired in him. I'm not sure I could find uh, qualities to be admired in Ripley. I mean, he had, might have a little generosity here and there, but not much to be admired. 
But he's not entirely to be uh, censored, I think. Simply because circumstances uh, do uh, mitigate. Well, yes, and, and also... <laughs> no, because, I mean, I can't excuse murder on those grounds. But because under normal <laughs> or everyday circumstances, Ripley uh, leads a quiet, um, constructive life. Well, it's constructive from his own point of view. It's a selfish life. But he's not doing anybody any harm. Except one day. <laughs> well, unless something turns up, of it course. Yeah. Tough. I don't really understand uh, murder, but perhaps that's what uh, fascinates me about it, because it is um, uh, snuffing out life or something like that. I mean, if, it, if one drowns a kitten in a bucket of water, for instance, you can see the... I've never done it, uh, but um, suddenly the kitten is dead, you see. Something has gone. Now, this, to me, is a mystery. And um, I don't really understand it. And I can't understand, um, uh, because I don't get angry in that fashion, you know, to hit somebody. And so, and I think in a way I'm interested in murder uh, for the reason, be just because I cannot really understand it. And, and because it is considered a, um, a very um, a serious crime, it should involve the uh, greatest guilt. I think Highsmith's style is extraordinary. It's obviously simple. She herself said she found a very simple style early on. That's to say it's syntactically simple. The sentences are very short, they're staccato, and crucially, they're almost all the same length. And this enables her to build this menace and disquiet because everything happens in the same space of words, whether somebody's looking at a picture, having a cup of coffee, throwing somebody down the stairs, throwing them into water, killing them, or rarely smiling at them. They all happen in the same space of sentence. Deadpan is the obvious word for her, her style. And it struck me when I was thinking about her, I think her great subject in a way is stalking. And in a way that's what her sentences do. Because that very even measured tread, one after the other, it's actually like hearing footfalls at night behind you. What, how would you describe Ripley's sexual nature? Mm, very difficult. Um, uh, he's rather shy of it and uh, not very strong emotions and uh, a little bit homosexual, I would say. Not that he's ever done anything about that. But very lukewarm. Yet he gets on very well indeed with his... Uh with his wife, Eloise. Yes. Well, there's such a thing as meeting the right person or something. Uh, in your books, there are often people together who dislike each other, but they're drawn tightly together. Um, I can think of all sorts of couplings, but let's take um, Ripley and Bernard in, uh, and Ripley Underground. Uh, would you describe that as a relationship of that type, and what attracts you to it in that category, sir? Um... Well, I, uh, it, fa it does fascinate me, yes, what the um, attraction of the opposites or something, or good and evil sort of thing. But in the case of uh, Ripley and Bernard, I think Bernard, he's not really attracted to, to uh, Ripley. He's rather afraid of him, and he, he dislikes him. But they get uh, drawn close together, though, don't they? You put them... Well, Ripley is much more attracted to Bernard in, in the sense that uh, he, he respects Bernard, the naivete and the... Um, goodness of Bernard, if I can use that word. R Ripley would, would be drawn to that out of fascination because he would think uh, not many people are born like Bernard. He floats above. He's more than semi-detached. He's living in a drift world of his own where he gets exactly what he wants by any means. But there's always a certain... Elegance is the wrong word, but... Um, he gets away with it with a certain style, I suppose. Uh, her style is very plain, and it was from the start. She's a member of those women who came in very forcefully as the second or third generation of women who are writing about crime or about murder. She's at the forefront of those. She was never part of that. She was very much alone and wolf isn't a bad word to use either. That hungry look, that contained look about her. 
um, we interviewed, we did the interview in the Savoy, uh, which somehow seemed a good place, rather detached from the real world, sort of floating above it. How would Ripley himself justify what he did if he were called on? He, what, what, what do you think he would say about, uh, in, as an excuse or as an explanation even, for what he did? There is none. I mean, except the, the there is no excuse for the for the first murder of Dickie, and the, there's no excuse for any of them. I mean, he could say it in words, but I don't think it would get him anywhere in a court of law. Because in some of your books, there's a questioning of whether there is anything, there is a, a, a such a thing as a sanctity of uh, as a sanctity of life. Would you think? Well, I don't think anybody can say whether there is or not, but it, it, that's just a mental attitude. It's like saying, should I have the attitude that there's a sanctity of life or something? And I don't think Ripley has much of that. Would you say that you had... When you said Not a lot, attitude. frankly, no. What do you think about the way in which we as a society look on and treat murderers? Well, I have to give you two or three answers. But first of all, I don't believe in capital punishment. And second, there, some murders are manslaughter. They're done in a moment of anger. They're un unpremeditated at any rate. And I don't see that it does any good to lock these such people up for 18 years. And then, on the other, then you have another kind of murderer who is really um, not right in the head, the kind of murderer who will probably do more out on the street, you know, for no reason. And such people have to be locked up for life. Is there any chance of you writing a Ripley book in which he will get uh, his comeuppance, or...? I hadn't thought about it. I mean, it's, it's not impossible, but I hadn't thought about it.